Hello and good afternoon. Welcome to another episode of Urban Strategy in the Present Tense, a webinar series powered by the Lindy Institute for Urban Innovation at Drexel University. My name is Andrew Zitzer. I'm an associate professor in Drexel's Antoinette Westfall College of Media, Arts and Design, where I direct the Urban Strategy Graduate Program. If you like what you hear today, consider looking into the Urban Strategy Program. We have a limited number of $25,000 Urban Innovation Scholarships still available for the fall upcoming 2024 semester for incoming graduate students. This afternoon, I'm excited to speak with Abby Sullivan and Franco Maltato about their work and efforts to build sustainability and bolster our resiliency. Today, we will ask and explore what steps can we take to become a more resilient city and region? What do cities need to ensure climate resilience and sustainability? All right, let me introduce our guests. Abby Sullivan is the Acting Chief Resilience Officer in the Philadelphia Office of Sustainability. In this role, she supports municipal climate change adaptation by translating climate science into actionable tools and information and leads Philadelphia's citywide resilience planning. Previously, she served as an environmental scientist at the Philadelphia Water Department for the Water Department's um, uh, with the Climate Change Adaptation Program, where she led the department's coastal flood resilience efforts. She also worked on public engagement and planning for the Water Department's Green Stormwater Infrastructure Program, Green City Clean Waters. Abby is on the steering committee and helped launch the PEERS Project, which stands for Practitioner Exchange for Effective Response to Sea Level Rise, a global community and effort of professionals working on sea level rise adaptation. Abby is a certified floodplain manager and serves on NASA's Sea Level Change Practitioner Consultation Board. Welcome, Abby. Dr. Mm -hmm. Franco Montalto is a licensed civil and environmental engineer with 30 years of research planning and design experience in ecological restoration, green infrastructure, and urban sustainability and resilience. He is a professor at Drexel University, where he directs the Sustainable Water Resource Engineering Lab and is also the founder and president of eDesign Dynamics LLC, an environmental consulting firm based in New York with an international portfolio of projects. He is a member of the fourth New York City panel on climate change, where he co-chairs the flooding, flooding working group and is an author of the recently released Northeast chapter of the fifth national climate assessment. So just to begin, I'll start the conversation with our guests and then we'll open the floor and reserve the final 10 minutes for questions from the audience. As we go, for everyone attending, please don't hesitate to share your comments and questions in the chat. So my first question for Abby and Franco, the climate crisis is already having real impacts on our everyday lives, not just something that will affect us in the future. Can you share some examples of how we're being impacted by climate change right now? And we'll begin with Abby. Hi, thank you. Um, yeah, this is a great question. Um, I think there's a lot of things that Philadelphia is already vulnerable to when it comes to um, extreme weather events. We live in a climate zone where we experience really hot summers. We're at a latitude where we can be hit by hurricanes and nor'easters. And climate change is really an amplifier. So what we're seeing is kind of the hazards that we've already always faced are getting more intense and they're happening more frequently. So what this means, the way this actually is experienced on the ground, you know, there's some really basic examples that we're all probably familiar with. So things like Hurricane Ida that came through a few years ago, you know, that's something that sticks out in our mind. These flooding events are getting more extreme and happening more often. Extreme heat, we were pretty, you know, pretty lucky last year in that Philadelphia wasn't one of the places like so many across the world that saw record um, extreme heat levels. Um, and then I think there's unexpected ways that we're being impacted, like the wildfire smoke that impacted air quality, right? So I think being able to connect these dots and also understand that it's also not always these extreme events, but there are small shifts in the average temperatures and um, average precipitation that we're seeing that make a difference over time. So you know, shifting seasons may mean that um, 
There's impacts to staffing from our parks department. They may have to do more mowing of the lawn. We might have subtle public health impacts due to you know, changing disease vectors over time. So I think there's a lot of really unexpected ways that things are changing, but we're definitely seeing the hazards that we've always faced amplified. And I can I can add a few things. I mean, that's generally you you sort of covered everything that I was going to say. Um, Sorry, <laughs> but I will. <laughs> but I will point out. Um, <clears throat> I think Andrew, your point about every day is really key, right? It's not. I think you know we've always had extreme events, but what what's changing is the frequency with which we're having uh, certain events, and that really has sort of impacts on lifestyle. So you know, Abby mentioned the wildfires, which <clears throat> you know are related to changes in precipitation in areas north of us, which then increases fire risk, which then increases the probability of fire, which then increases, you know, this whole cascading series of effects and ultimately changes air quality in Philadelphia and impacts your ability to go running, for example, right? So it comes into like an everyday activity that like, I would say that's something that for me was <laughs> very difficult for a period of time in the summer, I couldn't go running. Um, Warmer winters, you know, that is something that, you know, some people would say, well, I didn't like the snow anyway, it really caused a lot of problems, but there's really significant impacts on recreation, you know, folks who like to go skiing, um, you know, and, and the ski lodges themselves are, are struggling with something like that. Um, and, you know, extreme heat and humidity, which, you know, is just sort of creeping up slowly. And, you know, for me personally, it's made it more difficult for me to get my kids to go outside in the summer, because it's just uncomfortable. And, you know, so how do you want to um, address these issues? It's to me what's what's sort of really problematic is how it's now not just extreme events, but they're sort of gradual changes that are creeping up and beginning to affect the way we live, live every single day. So what was once extreme is no longer considered an extreme anymore. It's more of an everyday or cyclical event, and those things can be um, disturbing to our habits, but in the extreme disturbing to life, property, you know, our systems as well. Absolutely. So and to just, ground us in this conversation, it would be helpful to give a general sense of what's meant by climate resilience. Um, we we um, sometimes use the terms in, interchangeably. Is there a dis difference or a distinction between sustainability and resilience? Um, how do we need to understand this work? Yeah, I'm happy to tackle that one since I work in the Office of Sustainability on Climate on Resilience. Resilience. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think sustainability is a very broad and high level concept. It's the idea that we can meet our needs today while simultaneously um, you know, being able to have enough resources and everything we need to meet uh, the needs of future generations. And so this can touch on a whole host of things um, related to food and food access, waste and waste reduc reduction, how we manage our natural resources. Um, and a lot of these things can be impacted by climate change, but climate resilience is specifically the area that's trying to um, build the capacity of our society, economies, and environmental systems to cope with those climate impacts. So it's just like a level of specificity under, I would say, this broader umbrella of sustainability. Um, so I think when we're talking about climate resilience, and another term I wanna bring up is adaptation, climate adaptation. These Those two are often used interchangeably and they really do mean very similar things, but I would say resilience is really kind of like your capacity, your state of being, like how resilient you are to a shock or to a stress that's sort of chronic over time. Adaptation is really that process of changing. You know, we think about evolution, um, things adapting. And so it's really, one is really the state of being and one is the process. So I think generally we've switched to using the term resilience, but a lot of people still use adaptation. And then the last thing I'll say is just when you talk about mitigation, if you work in the climate space, you're talking about reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So trying to mitigate climate change, but in the hazard um, emergency planning world, mitigation is often used to talk about mitigating the effects of climate change. So it gets very confusing very quickly, but 
I think, yeah, setting the differences between those terms is really important. Yeah, and I, I'll add a few things. So, I mean, you can think of, if we want to be formal about structure, right, the Sustainable Development Goals, which are the UN's approach to sustainability. There are 17 SDGs. They include things like poverty, gender equality, you know, oceans, land, um, conflict resolution, cities, there's a whole bunch of things. SDG 13 is called climate action. So you could, in that sense, climate action is within... It's one of many goals that you might have for sustainability, as Abby mentioned, a sustainability being a, a sort of a broader term. And within, if you look at SDG, uh, if you look at the text around SDG 13, there are those two buckets, the, <clears throat> the um, mitigation, which is reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and then the adaptation. But I want to add one more thing on resilience, because I actually just did <clears throat> a little bit of a deep dive into this term um, for some work that I'm, I'm doing um, on the New York City panel on climate change. And there's sort of three different ways that I think resilience has come to be known, right? One is with a sort of a resistance approach, like, hey, I'm going to draw the line, right? Your water isn't coming into my neighborhood, or that heat is not coming into this building. It's this sort of um, this sort of keep back the keep back the hazard and and maintain the status quo behind my level of protection, right? So I would call that the resistance approach to resilience. Then there's sort of the adaptation approach, which is kind of adjusting and accommodating to this new normal. So you could think of that as like if you're flood proofing your home, you're putting certain um, you're, you're you're putting certain protective areas around the lower level so that water can't get in. You're you're adapting to this new normal. Um, you're not you're allowing the water to come in or you come close, but you're protecting yourself. So that's adaptation. And then the last one, which is really beginning to get a lot of attention is called transformation, right? So that's acknowledging that the future is going to be very, very different than the past and um, <clears throat> that it might require some really fundamental differences in how we live, where we live. Um, and so it might require sort of transformation, like large-scale transformation of not just the physical um, places that we live, but the, the social systems, the institutional systems, the infrastructure systems. And there's, you know, I think if you read some of the more recent work that's been done by the IPCC, you know, it's sort of an all of the above type of an approach is necessary, right? We need these little adaptation adaptations done. And in the meantime, as we plan longer term, um, longer term transformation, which in some places, um, you know, is looked at as an inevitable future condition. Um, but I think there's some really interesting ethical questions about um, which areas we decide to transform and which areas we allow to just evolve in an uncontrolled state. That's to me, a very interesting sort of set of ethical questions um, where we provide protection, where we assume, assume people will accommodate on their own and where we say, no, we're going to actually facilitate a long-term tr transformation of this place. Franco, just remind our listeners what the IPCC is. Oh, I'm sorry. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. That's the international group that has been issuing reports um, about climate change for the past several decades. Great. Can I add one thing to that? I mm -hmm. think um, those are really, really interesting points. And I think there is a, an approach that's emerged um, that uses all three of those called DAP, Dynamic Adaptive Policy Pathways, or there's slight variations, but most people call it DAP. And it's this idea that you look, you know, you understand your system, you understand where the thresholds are, where there's tipping points in your system. So this might be sea level rise can get to a certain point before you determine that the risk is too great. Then you monitor and you have, you know, you see if you're reaching that tipping point. And then if you are, that triggers actions. And I think you can use all three of those approaches. You know, you almost build like a subway map of different options for future actions that you can take depending on what sort of um, future scenario plays out, right? Because we don't know what's going to happen with emissions. We don't know what kind of temperature changes we're really facing. Um, so that's one thing. And then really quickly, I would just say, it also really, really matters that we coordinate on this. So um, this is a few years old now at this point, but the University of Delaware had done some um, research on 
sea level rise and coastal adaptation options in the Delaware estuary where Philadelphia live lies. And um, it found that if most of the communities harden their shorelines, that will directly change the amount of sea level rise that we experience in Philadelphia. If they harden their shorelines, it changes the depth of the water, it changes the tidal prism, and it will mean we see a lot of sea level rise. It makes the, the um, tidal range greater. But if those communities instead, like Franco was saying, learn to sort of live with water, let it come in, we decide where we want to protect, where we want to let water in and maybe retreat, that could mean Philadelphia sees lower sea levels. So it really, it's almost existential that we work together and we don't all just like race to harden and protect what we have. That's a good segue to our next question, which is to go from the macro to the, you know, to the regional. And, you know, when we talk about the big picture of climate resiliency, it touches down in Philadelphia as well, as you're saying. So can you share an example or two of how these resilience strategies relate specifically to Philadelphia and the Philadelphia region. And either of you can jump in there. Sure, I can talk a little bit about Eastwick. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so Eastwick, for uh, those of you who are not familiar, is a community in Southwest Philadelphia um, that uh, that floods uh, and has flooded um, devastatingly in certain instances, going back to Hurricane Floyd. Um, and, you know, a lot of it has to do with um, the sort of history of development in that region. It used to be wetlands, it's now filled in, but also, um, you know, sort of a, a long history of that includes urban renewal and and also changes that have to do, that occurred really far outside of Eastwick in the 79 square mile watershed that um, contributes water <clears throat> to the Darby and Cobbs Creek, which passed sort of right, right through Eastwick. And I mean, if that, you know, to think about the options for reducing flooding, which are sort of a current area of discussion among well, with the city and also other agencies, you can see these sort of three examples, these three approaches kind of side by side, right? So I'll, as the example of the resistance approach, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has a tentatively selected plan, which does, which means that it's, you know, their studies have arrived at the conclusion that this might be something, uh, it's not, it's not a done deal, but that involves a levee along the side of Cobbs Creek. So a levee is just sort of a, an embankment, a berm that's built up. And it, when you get a flood wave coming down Cobbs Creek, the water can't overtop the bank. And, and so we're resisting, right? So that's one example. Um, you know, as an example of the adaptation approach, there are sort of micro scale things that residents have had to do. If you if you talk to residents of Eastwick or if anyone from Eastwick is on the call, you know, there are people who are have put in sump pumps and they've, you know, they've elevated their utilities. They've done things because they know that it's a flood prone area and they've adjusted, right? So that's the adaptation approach. And then with the sort of transformation approach, there are kind of two ideas that that I've been sort of talking to people about that are really interesting. Um, one is sort of really high end capture of stormwater in the watershed. And I mean, in ways that we haven't seen before, right? If our modeling is correct, it says that if you, you have to capture runoff from 65% of the urban of the impervious surfaces in this 79 square mile region that's like orders of magnitude more than the amount of stormwater capture that would happen say for water quality improvement right but if we were able to do something like that um the modeling suggests that a big event like isaias which flooded eastwick won't wouldn't flood but that's transformation right because it's very hard to get your head around how would you in a fully developed watershed have that level of of greening happen or, you know, some of the residents of Eastwick have proposed an idea of a land swap where folks who live in the flood prone, low lying area move to the some of the higher elevation land, and they are able to in that way stay within Eastwick, um, but, uh, but, but not live in immediate harm, right? So you, you got in, in one community, you already have these sort of competing ideas. Um, and what's really interesting is how the discussion uh, includes various stakeholders and and you know how the community is working with with the city how the city is working with you know larger federal agencies that are involved um and how you know upstream and downstream communities might start talking to each other to sort of get to this 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 uh this level of resilience that we all would would like to see happen that's just one example Yeah, I'll try to keep this brief. I guess I would start off 
by saying, um, you know, to get a bit more granular on the work that we're doing in the city, um, there's a lot that our office is doing. And I'm happy, I will go into detail on some of the initiatives that we have, but I want to start by saying that a lot of this work has to happen within each department, right? Like our tiny little team of four people can't, you know, fix or, you know, meet all the needs across the city for resilience. And we're not subject matter experts in everything. So for example, I really know very little about um, streets and the infrastructure of streets. I know a lot more about the water department, but there's things that I am not a subject matter expert on. So I think what our office does is we play key roles in knowing the climate science and being able to provide almost like climate services, what we call climate services to other departments, and then working on policies, plans, and programs, and then sometimes projects um, that really start to embed resilience in everything that the city is doing. And I think trying to embed it and have it be more of like a systematic approach rather than like one department is doing this is really the way it needs to happen, but it also makes it really hard to track success, right? So if every single department starts using climate projections and the best practices in planning, that's great. But those small changes to projects are gonna show up in those departments' budget asks. It's gonna be really hard to like really track everything that we're doing, um, but not trying to point out the, the hard things about it. Um, I guess some examples I would quickly give um, shout out to our Parks and Recreation Department. They put out a really amazing tree filly plan, which is really the city's, and the city, I mean, like the broad city, it's not just the municipal city, it's the entire city's plan for increasing the canopy cover in Philadelphia. And so that really gets to the heart of um, not only improving air quality, reducing emissions, um, but also trying to equitably address um, our urban heat islands in the city. So that's an example of a plan. A program, we also have a program called Eastwick from Recovery to Resilience. So Franco, we work a lot with Franco um, and you know, build off of the modeling that he's done and uh, have a really great partnership with Drexel in that regard. But we've put over $1.5 million of you know, municipal investment, philanthropic, um, federal grants we've been pulling in, and we've regranted a lot of that money to the community to sort of increase their capacity um, to be, you know, co-developers in coming up with the solutions that we need to have there to address flooding. So that's sort of a program level. And then policies, an example of a policy is, you know, could we enact a policy that says, during an extreme heat event, we, you know, workers that are in the field must get this many breaks. We're working on things like that at the policy level. Another example is that we have um, more stringent floodplain regulations than are required by the federal government. So um, we add additional what's called freeboard on top of the amount that you're supposed to build above, you know, a certain safety level for flooding we add on additional height that you have to build. So that's like a local policy example. So I'll stop there. That's great. And it, it, it we did get a question in the Q&A, Abby. Somebody wanted to know if you could share the name of the U, U Delaware study on sea level rise uh, or share it in the chat if you have it. I don't have it like right off the top of my head, but I can try to find it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, and we can also send it out in a follow-up email to the attendees okay. of the webinar. So I want to mm -hmm. dig a little deeper into this notion of working with community because it's one thing to sort of make policies for how city workers are supposed to be treated. It's an important thing to have a Philly tree plan that's citywide, but I know that sometimes these climate resilience challenges touch down in communities and there are very specific techniques and tools for effective community engagement. Um, and that's something that is a really big focus of my interest and, and of my urban strategy program. So I wonder if you could each give any examples of working in community um, and what are the special challenges and opportunities of doing community-based resilience planning? Um, I could start if you want. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll wear uh, my researcher hat 
um, <clears throat> and say, you know, one of the things that I think is an opportunity for Philadelphia is we have 64 regional institutions of higher education, 21 within the city. And in those institutions, there are um, students who want to make the world a better place. That's why they're studying whatever they're studying. And there are knowledgeable researchers and scientists of different stripes that want to apply their science in a way that serves the community. Um, and so one of the things that I've sort of seen as an opportunity is like, why can't we, since we're in a situation where there are the problems are bigger than the resources that are available, um, why can't we leverage all of that work that's happening uh, at the university, um, all the universities, um, to to sort of integrate problem solving into the learning process because we just don't have the time to like educate all these folks who then will start solving problems right then we need to be starting solving problems now and the the how to solve problems and and in this gets right to what abby was saying before these types of problems cannot be solved in a top-down manner right you can't sit in your laboratory or at your desk and write an equation and say here's the solution and we're going to implement it the only way that these solutions um, are developed is through collaboration and collaboration, not just with the governmental decision makers, but also with the folks who are experiencing, who are on the front line of the climate crisis and who can tell you, you can tell me um, exactly what, you know, what the problem is. And so as a researcher, <clears throat> you know, as I try to do this, to me, the, there are sort of three questions. You know, one is where do I do my research? I mean, I could do my research somewhere that has lots and lots and lots of other resources. And then I'm kind of a blip, you know, in in the universe. Um, or I could decide to do my research in a place that is in need of additional, you know, that doesn't have those resources available to it. So that's that's sort of thing number one. The second point is what questions am I seeking to answer? And I think, you know, for scientists and academics, this is, you know, I think worthy of a pause, right? Because we tend to have a hypothesis or we've written a paper and we want to do the next study that logically would come after this. And so we impose, you know, a problem on a place and say that I want to study this in that place. Um, where if you talk to the people who live in that place, that's not what they want to study. They, they say, we don't need that study. We need a different study, right? So being able to listen um, and to absorb the what's what information is being transmitted from from the community back to you, and and then being nimble enough to change your approach, um, is I think you know point number two. So you know what questions am I asking? Are they the right questions? And then you know how can science be impactful? Because in some cases, you know, the question that comes back is really not about science. It's about um, it's about you know, some way that policy needs to be shifted. Uh, but then you can ask the question of, well, why is the policy that way in the first place? And there might be a sort of underlying assumption about what is more impactful than another thing. And so you can then use your science strategically to get right at that question. And, you know, I mean, this is how I did years of research on green infrastructure starting in the very beginning when nobody thought that green infrastructure could actually be a thing um, was, you know, cost effectiveness studies, comparing this to that, et cetera. So, you know, I think those are from a research perspective, it's, you know, it's, it's thinking about where your research can be most impactful, being flexible and listening and, and adjusting your research to answer the real policy relevant and community relevant questions that emerge. Thank you. Abby, anything to add on that? Yeah. I mean, I think there's definitely been a paradigm shift in planning all forms of planning i think um it's not really acceptable to do it without engaging with community and really understanding the values understanding the questions that you're asking and i think especially if you work in the city um you know there's been past practices you know franco mentioned urban renewal there have been racist housing policies. Um, you know, I think this there are direct actions that city planners have done in the past that have across the country that have led to 
some populations being more vulnerable to impacts than others. So I think as civil servants and, you know, working in the public sector, I think we feel even, you know, more passionately that we have to do this right this time around. We have to really be working with communities to understand what their needs are and what their um, values are. So um, when I was first hired, I was, and I think Frank has heard me say this story before, but I was basically asked to update the city's resilience plan in like a little over a year with no resources. And I pretty much said, I'm not going to do that. Like I, I will look for, you know, resources. I'm happy to approach philanthropy if the city doesn't have the funds. Um, but I'm not going to produce something that doesn't involve working with community. And I think it's been a struggle because um, there's not a lot of funding out there. There's a lot more funding, especially coming from the federal government for mitigation work. So trying to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. I think everybody understands how important the engagement is, but it's an incredibly resource intensive process, right? If you're going to hold um, engagements and you want to do them in the best way possible, you should have translation services. You should make sure that there, you know, anything you do is accessible. You should have interpretation. You should have food, ideally. You should pay participants if they're from underserved communities. Like there's all these best practices that just mean that to have a really robust, inclusive process is a commitment. It's a commitment of staff time. It's a commitment of resources. And Unfortunately, Philadelphia has a lot of competing priorities, and I think the connections between climate and some of these other issues that we face aren't always understood. So um, we've been working really hard to go after some funds and um, hopeful with the new administration that, you know, we might have um, more resources to put towards this work. But Fingers crossed, we are going to have a really robust engagement process that will support our resilience plan kicking off this summer. Um, and I do just have to give a really quick shout out to our team. We have um, my predecessor, Celine Chapman, I think did a really amazing job of setting up sort of a place-based model um, to work on climate resilience. And so we think about the work that we're doing on our team in these sort of tiers, like nested Russian dolls. So like I'm leading a lot of the citywide planning, trying to coordinate among departments. Then we have staff that are focused specifically on flooding and heat. And then below that, not it, there's not a hierarchy, but like if you think about the scales it is, um, we have a place-based team that's doing like a deep dive into the community in Eastwick, trying to build that trust, really aiming to sort of focus on flooding, but also other quality of life issues. Um, so we have an entire role on our team that they're, they're we call them a community navigator. So even though we're there to, to address um, flooding, their role is to really connect with other quality of life issues, like the light is out on the street and it's not being replaced. Um, so I think we're trying to take a whole of government approach and I think I mentioned before that we're re-granting a lot of our funds to some community-based organizations to help build their capacity so that they actually have the ability to meet us halfway and, and actually co-lead this process. So, And I, I just want to, Abby, give hats off to your office for that place-based initiative and let you know that actually um, I was invited by NOAA to go down to Silver Springs, Maryland to talk about, you know, they've, they've given us funding and we've done stuff with that mm -hmm. funding, but then along come other federal agencies and they're not talking to, to NOAA. So the research that we do is not. And yeah. so like mm -hmm. in this group of 300 people on a panel discussion, they said, well, what could we be doing differently to cause, you know, to allow sort of collaboration between federal agencies? And I said, well, you should look at Philadelphia's place-based initiatives because when you have one person like mm -hmm. Tentacool in one community who's then bringing together all of yep. the issues. And many of them, you know, like you said earlier, our climate is a, is an, is an amplifier of these other issues. And if there is no dedicated mm -hmm. um, resources for climate and there is no regulatory requirement that we address climate, you, you're sort of stuck. It yep. has to be, it has to be integrated into what these other agencies are doing. So as you're managing streets, as you're managing water, yep. as you're managing power, right? 
and and so the place based initiative i really feel like is a really exciting way of sort of integrating and creating these sort mm -hmm. of lateral connections that i think you know as i said as i mentioned in front yeah. of all these people mm -hmm. at noaa like that could be replicated in other places that's it's an it's an amazing model thanks yeah we're trying to scale up the program and we're really excited we did get an epa government to government grant um million dollar grant it's going to support a few programs, but it will allow us to expand that place-based program to another neighborhood to address um, extreme heat. So we're excited about that. And we've, um, we're have we hoping to expand the program um, in the coming year with some other funding sources as well. Um, and I think the last thing I'll say, because I know we need to move on, but um, I think that team does so much work with the community. I mean, they're literally out in the neighborhood multiple times a week sometimes, but they also do a ton of coordination among all the federal agencies, state, local departments, and then also with researchers and doing sort of model co coordination as well. So yeah, I think it's that sort of three-pronged, like looking at all of the stakeholders basically and trying to involve everybody. So a couple of quick clarifying questions. First of all, what's NOAA? The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. It's a federal agency in the Department of Commerce. Excellent. Thank you. And also, are there, this is a question from the audience, are there any other place-based initiatives besides Eastwick, or is Eastwick sort of the pilot and others are going to potentially come with additional funding? So the place-based work was actually piloted first in Hunting Park. Um, there was a project called Beat the Heat. Um, and I think the challenge is that, you know, resources have waxed and waned and priorities have shifted. And so I think the unfortunate thing is that we're not doing a deep dive in that community right now. I, I think the idea was, or the hope was that we could build that community capacity and work with community-based organizations um, and then do what we can on the city side. But then at some point, hopefully they can drive the process and really, you know, I think the decision makers should be the people that live in those communities. So keeping in touch with them, but, but really having them drive the process, but we do also, um, like I said, we're going to expand to do another community to look at heat. Um, we have a program that's looking at large investments that are going into the lower South area of the city. Um, so less on the community stakeholder engagement side, but more on, you know, engaging with some of the big partners like Hilco that's redeveloping the refinery and the Navy Yard and what's happening with the port and making sure that the billions of dollars of investment that are going in are considering climate change. Um, but we don't have capacity to really be working in all the neighborhoods we need to be in in Philadelphia. So that's definitely a need and we hope to expand in the future. That's a great segue to talking about um, coordinating with other cities. Um, and so we have a question from the audience that says, where does the city see opportunities to coordinate resilience efforts with other cities and regional agencies like the Delaware Valley Regional Planning Commission? Um, and I would ask both of you to think about just like what's the regionality or the sort of national uh, connection that Philadelphia can have to other places. I mean, I can start and just say we work with DVRPC a lot. Um, and I think we really rely on them. It's it's really hard to break down what we don't call them silos, but our cylinders of excellence. <laughs> it's hard to break down even like among two departments that work together. So um, I think trying to expand out to a regional perspective and trying to do that planning just becomes exponentially harder. So we really, really value the work that they're doing and trying to take that sort of regional approach. We're learning in Eastwick that we absolutely have to be thinking about this in a regional way, right? What we do on the Philadelphia side impacts Delaware County. So we really have to be doing this work together. Um, we did we did work with DVRPC to try to um, apply to a really massive NOAA grant for doing coastal resilience in the region. Unfortunately, we weren't invited to the final application stage, but um, I think we're trying to sort of 
get that initiative going through other um, funding sources. So, yeah. And I'll just say from my perspective, you know, there's lots of um, <clears throat> NGOs, government agencies, um, community-based organizations that have resources to do a thing in a place, right? And yet there are really big opportunities for knowledge transfer between these. And there are also sort of integrator activities that could happen. You know, for example, I'm engaged in a project right now where we're simulating sea level rise impacts on the Delaware River on both sides of the Delaware River, um, including so that's New Jersey and the Pennsylvania side. Um, and that work, for example, could have some relevance to place-based planning that might be happening in New Jersey, but also place-based planning that might be happening in Delaware County or that could be happening. And I don't know that we have, um, <clears throat> I mean, my impression is that there is no sort of central organizer, right? It, it, you know, as Abby's been saying, like the city has the resources that it has, but it doesn't have the resources to, to do everything, right? And um, <clears throat> so, I really feel like there's a need for regional coordination um, on a lot of issues um, that are related to climate, that are re related to economic development, that are related to a whole bunch of issues. Um, and, and that regional co um, sort of coordination would help us get into some of the ethical questions, right? Especially about, you know, as we were talking about before, manage retreat, you know, so, you know, this community is getting treated this way in this place and another community is getting treated that way. I mean, we have development happening here, but we're not, we don't want it to happen there. Um, <clears throat> but it's it's sort of not clear to me exactly where, you know, what level of, of governance, and I say governance and not government, because, you know, maybe there's a role for NGOs to play or um, academia, you know, some institute in an academic institution that sort of is keeping tabs on all of the related studies that are going on and related policy initiatives that are going on and sort of putting it together. Um, but I think Philadelphia region could really benefit from some coordination and uh, synchronization of efforts, um, especially when it comes to sort of climate issues. I, I'll add one other thing, you know, I'm on the New York City panel on climate change and it's a bunch of volunteer academics and others who, write reports that talk about the impacts of climate change in this city. Um, and I mean, Abby and I have talked about this before, like it would be great if there were the ability, and I know the resources are limited, but there were the ability to do something like that for the Philadelphia region, right? We, again, you know, tapping into all of the scientific knowledge that's at the universities, all of the community knowledge that's at the community-based organizations, all of the NGOs, all of the regional planning, local planning, you know, municipal planning, all of that. I mean, Philadelphia region is known nationally for its green infrastructure program. I mean, there's a lot of there's a, a lot of really exciting stuff happening here. Um, and if there were a way to sort of bring it all together, interpret it, and apply sort of a climate uh, filter on it, and say, well, how you know, do we need more of this or less of that, or is there something we're missing altogether? That could have regional value, I think. Um, it's just a matter of figuring out how to make something like that happen. I think it's a great call to action. And, you know, in as you're talking, some of our, our attendees are offering their own policy prescriptions and solutions in the form of questions, saying that perhaps the tree plan could pick up on the foundation the city developed in Hunting Park, or if DVP, DVRPC, the Regional Planning uh, Coalition, could function or commission could function like a council of governments to do more coordination and synchronization of governments in the um, in the region. So I won't ask you to speculate if those things are possible, but I know that um, there's good ideas floating around for um, both place-based and regional efforts that include community-based organizations, NGOs, city officials, academics, and and others. And that that leads me to my next question, which is basically. Are there models and uh, inspirations that you've gotten from your peers in your travels um, that we could apply here in Philadelphia if we have the resources and if we have the bandwidth? What inspires you about some of the work being done around the country? Abby, you wanna go? Sure. Um, I think, I mean, I think 
Franco's right. I think Philadelphia is leading in a lot of ways, and then in some ways we're not. And so I think there's definitely examples out there of things that are working that we are not doing in Philadelphia that I would love to see happen. Um, so three that I'll quickly mention. One is figuring out a dedicated funding source to fund climate projects. So for implementation, um, an example is Portland, Oregon. They have um, basically it's a fee that is added on to a business application for any business making over a billion dollars a year that isn't headquartered in Seattle. And that brings in it's, you know, changes year to year, but it's like 45 to $65 million a year. And they're using that money to, um, you know, I think they have a really great model on how they distribute it. It's uh, largely directed by CBOs, community-based organizations and the work they're already doing, but you know, they're, they're buying heat pumps for residents with this money. So I think we need a dedicated funding source for resilience. Um, another thing I really love to see happen in Philadelphia are resilience hubs. So I think most people might be familiar with the fact that during an extreme heat event, we have cooling centers, really our rec centers or libraries that open additional hours and have, you know, provide a space where residents can cool down if they don't have um, cooling systems in their home. So a resilience hub is kind of that on steroids. Um, Baltimore has a really fantastic resilience hub. Uh, so it's this idea of a space that would have, you know, uh, renewable energy, it would be resilient to grid shutdowns if the energy grid shut down. Um, it would have, you know, cooling if we need cooling, heat if it was a code blue event. Um, but the other key thing is that these spaces have programming throughout the year. So it's not just about a space for emergencies, it's also about building community resilience, being a community space for community groups. Um, Maybe it works on workforce development. Mm -hmm. So I think those are really, really inspiring examples. Um, there's also where my team, Elaine Montez, is leading a project to look at whether Philadelphia can get a property level flood mitigation program off the ground. So that's where the city could actually set up a program and an infrastructure to assist residents um, in making adjustments to their home to make them more resilient to flooding. And we're doing the same on sort of the energy efficiency side and trying to get people's homes, um, you know, with cooling and renewables and things like that, too. I'll just add sort of a different flavor of example. I'm really interested in ways of engaging everyday people in the development of resilience strategies, right? Because we hear that, that, that you know, this can't be a top-down uh, approach and that it's an it has to be a collaborative approach and there are um and what we were hearing from you know community based organizations everywhere is that they don't want to be planned for they want to be engaged in the planning so um there are some really i sort of pay attention to these models that engage in a substantive way um residents in management of risk so for example the um I do a lot of work in, well, I have a lot of collaborations in Northern Italy and in Venice, which is a city that has massive flood problems, um, wetlands are being eroded because of this sea level rise. And as a result, fishermen have been out of work. And um, so an EU funded project called the Life Vimine Project actually pays fisher people to use their boats to restore wetlands that mitigate the impacts of the sea level rise. So think about sort of like the, what's happening here, right? You're creating jobs, you're creating wetlands, and you're doing it through these like micro adaptation strategies that are improving the sort of quality of life for a, an important sort of economic constituency of the city. And that same project is operating in the city of Padua and where they're actually employing uh, migrants who have come to Padua and are waiting for their um, their uh, papers to come through uh, in the restoration of some stream corridors where debris is causing flooding because the stream corridors are black. So you so you've got this. You're you're now putting people to work who have recently arrived in your city, 
and you're solving an environmental problem. And I, I'm really sort of fascinated, and we've done this with um, some of our heat mitigation work in the city over the past few years, where we employed residents in building shade structures that then get deployed in front of their house, and they're paid for that, right? So it's work. Um, and I, so I'm really excited about ways of, of doing that, right? Not, I mean, we talk about citizen science, but it's often sort of you know, like it would be nice to get some data through citizen science, but I like citizen engagement, right? Paid engagement, citizen participation, let's just say, in some of these really important um, sort of micro adaptation tasks that that we need um, if if we're going to, you know, tackle adaptation and climate change from the bottom up and because we know we can't do it from the top down. That's a great segue. We're coming towards the end of our time. And one of the things I wanted to ask both of you to sort of muse on is what makes you hopeful? What encourages you about this very complex, very daunting task of climate change resilience? Um, is there anything that we can look to and feel hopeful about? Want me to go first? <laughs> sure. I mean, I'm I'm hopeful. I'm I'm an optimistic person in general. Just you know, have to start there and say I'm not I'm not a negative person. I'm not a pessimistic person. I'm always I couldn't do this work if I was a pessimistic person because the problems are so huge that I would just you know give up right away. And I I am optimistic because I see the conversation evolving and growing, and I see more people participating. And I think you know. The negative thing that you started off with, Andrew, is saying like, how is this affecting us? And we're saying, well, it's affecting everyday life. I think more and more people, because it's affecting everyday life, more and more people are sort of recognizing the need for action. And um, yeah, there are some really big battles that 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 need to be fought. Um, but I see, you know, a growing uh, sort of a snowball of people who are getting more and more engaged in this work. And I see it, it, the relevance of this type of work being perceived by people from lots of different disciplines, right? It used to be 15 years ago, it was really only climate scientists who were talking about climate change. But now, I mean, public health practitioners, engineers, water resources people, ecological folks, you know, um, social scientists, people interested in equity, fairness, you know, they're all sort of talking about climate. And that I think bodes well for, you know, the possibility for collaboration going forward to really address this in a meaningful way. I let you go first, because I didn't want to say something that like take something away from you. But I do think seeing, um, I mean, I feel old saying this, but like younger generations, right? Like the students that are so interested and passionate about this topic is really promising because they are the future, as cheesy as that sounds. Um, so I think, yeah, seeing the interest from students and also I think this is just echoing what Franco was saying, seeing the drastic change in people's sort of understanding and the attention that's being brought to it. I mean, you can't really look at the newspaper on any day without there being something about climate change. So I think that is a drastic change from even a decade ago. So I think, that and on the mitigation side, I think there's less to be hopeful there, except I will say that I do think the technology is changing really rapidly, like faster than was expected. So, um, you know, the federal funding from IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act has also been um, really amazing. And from IIJA, Infrastructure and Jobs Act. Um, so I do think seeing the actual investments and seeing the technology changing really rapidly is something to be hopeful for. And lastly, I do think, and curious to see what Franco thinks about this, but I think the climate science is still very uncertain and it's changing rapidly, but I do see the uncertainty ranges like decreasing. And I think, you know, the latest sea level rise projection report that came out from NOAA and NASA you know, nobody really publicized the fact that the the range of the projections drastically was reduced and the high end that we're projected to see by the end of the century, feet of sea level rise were taken off of that. Now, it's still not a great situation, but like we're moving in the right direction of like reducing that uncertainty and really understanding where we're headed, which allows you to plan in a much more focused way. And I would say like to, to parallel that though, I think the fact that 
the fact that there are ranges that need to be considered and that the future to some extent, well, to a great extent, is still uncertain has become a greater part of the lexicon, right? I mean, it's it, it used to be that that uncertainty led to paralysis. Like, well, you can't, you can't tell me exactly how much sea level rise there's going to be. Well, then I don't even know. But what I'm seeing is more and more, you know, decisions that say, okay, it, we acknowledge it's going to be uncertain, but we're going to do something and we're going to pick. And you might pick the number in the middle range. You might pick the high end. You might pick the low end, but at least there's a discussion uh, about that. And it's not hindering our ability to do anything, which I think was very much uh, a part of sort of early phases of, of adaptation planning. So the way we like to wrap these conversations up is to basically ask you about your own journey as an urban strategist and a sustainability resilience person, and to ask you if there's any milestones you've had in your career, especially early on, or any people who've inspired mm -hmm. you. Um, we get prospective students and students on these calls and just you know, like what was an example of something that really turned you in the direction that you're in now from early on? You want, to, you want to go, Abby? Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I could talk forever about this, unfortunately, but I won't. Um, I'll just say one thing. When I was in grad school, I was doing a minor in planning and my major in environmental engineering. And I just kept getting so enraptured by all of the stuff that planners talked about, all of the, you know, sort of equity questions and policy questions and, you know, that, you know, that sort of history of why things are the way they are. And I was about to quit engineering. I was about, to, I just said, you know what, I'm going to be a planner. And somebody came to me at that moment who was an engineer who had become a planner. And he said, well, you could do that. But you could also be that engineer in the room that is willing to work on these complex issues from an engineering perspective. And that was really, I think, instrumental for me in remaining an engineer who works on these issues was that there is a way to work on sort of big, broad questions from your disciplinary perspective. And I think, you know, if you're a student who's studying planning or if you're studying medicine or if you're studying social science, as long as you have the will to, to engage in this discussion, you know, it doesn't matter what your disciplinary background is. All disciplines have something important to bring to the table right now. And um, don't think that you have to change, <laughs> you know, just, you, you know, whatever tools you're learning in your classes are relevant in some way or another. Um, I wasn't sure how I was going to answer this, but I guess I would just like to first point out that I have a really odd trajectory to getting where I am today. I started in fine art, um, studied ceramics and photography, and worked in museums for many years, which I still love and hold dear to my heart, um, but really kind of changed paths um, when I went back to school. And I actually think that's been to my benefit. I think some people know exactly what they want to do and they go for it and that's fantastic. But I do think that sort of interdisciplinary path that I took has really given me, you know, almost echoing what Franco's saying, like, you know, you can bring different perspectives um, to a field. And I guess I would say as far as um, people that have inspired me or, you know, shaped the work that I do, I think, Working at the water department was a really, really, and now at the Office of Sustainability, but the water department was a really amazing experience. I just, there's, I think there's this perception that um, people that work for the city don't work hard, you know, good enough for government work, but I've never met people that work harder than the civil servants that are working in the water department and the Office of Sustainability um, and emergency management and health. I mean, People are working well over 40 hours a week and just doing phenomenal work. So um, there's definitely mentors I've had over the years um, at the water department that have just really shown me how you work hard and you really are working for the people. Um, Joanne Dom was an amazing leader at the water department, Mark Camerata, Kelly Anderson, Julia Rockwell, consultants we worked with, Mark Mamoni is like amazing. Um, so yeah, I think having those mentors that are willing to also like shepherd you as a new early career person are really, really important. And the city has just really phenomenal people that are dedicated 
to making life better in Philadelphia. So I know that's my like weird PR pitch for working for the city, but you should all apply. <laughs> I love it. Well, thank you so much, Abby Sullivan and Franco Montalto. Thank you for sharing your stories and experience and this important work this afternoon. Um, remember, this is part of uh, the Urban Strategy in the Present Tense series. We uh, are produced by the Lindy Institute for Urban Innovation at Drexel University in partnership with the Urban Strategy Master's Program in Drexel's Antoinette, Col Antoinette Westfall College of Media Arts and Design. I am your host, Andrew Zitzer. You can email me if you have more questions about the program or the series at awz25 at drexel.edu uh, or visit us on our website. Um, and I want to offer special thanks to our producer, Thomas Devaney, and our production director, Hazel DeQuito. And we'll be back again with another webinar coming up soon. So thank you so much to everyone for joining. Thank you, Andrew.